Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series, Poems, Prayers, and Promises, a look at a variety of psalms. The psalms are the prayers of God's people, encouraging and teaching us how to pray in our day. We hope this helps you understand and apply God's Word in your life today. I'm going to read from Psalm 34, and I'm going to read the whole thing, and I'm going to ask that you turn your attention to the Word of God. Psalm 34 is of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer and want hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Uh, seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their, all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps it all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. May God be honored and praised in the reading of his word. I'm going to read a little, uh, uh, convey a little story to you. Together, we entered the terrifying building. At a table were women who took all our possessions. This is a woman speaking. Everyone had to undress completely and then go to a room where her hair was checked. I asked a woman who was busy checking the possessions of the new arrivals if I might use the toilet. She pointed to a door, and I discovered that the convenience was nothing more than a hole in the shower room floor. Betsy stayed close beside me all the time. Suddenly, I had an inspiration. Quick, take off your woolen underwear, I whispered to her. I rolled it up with mine and laid, it in, laid the bundle in a corner with my little Bible. The spot was alive with cockroaches, but I didn't worry about that. I felt wonderfully relieved and happy. The Lord is busy answering our prayers, Betsy, I whispered. We shall not have to make sacrifice of all our clothes. We hurried back to the row of women waiting to be undressed. A little later, after we had had our showers and put on our shirts, and shabby dresses, I hid the roll of underwear and my Bible under my dress. But I prayed, Lord, cause now thine angels to surround me and let them not be transparent today for the guards must not see me. I felt perfectly at ease. Calmly, I passed the guards. Everyone was checked from the front, the sides, the back. Not a bulge escaped their eye, the eyes of the guard. The woman just in front of me had hidden a woolen vest under her dress. It was taken from her. They let me pass, for they did not even see me. Betsy, right behind me, was fully searched. But outside awaited another danger. On each side of the door were women who looked, every, looked everyone over for a second time. They felt over the body, 
each one who passed by. I knew they would not see me, for the angels were still surrounding me. I was not even surprised when they passed by me. But with, my rose, with me rose the jubilant cry, O oh Lord, if thou does so answer prayer, I can now even face Ravensbrook unafraid. Many of you know who that story is. That's Corey Ten Boom. Yes, hallelujah, huh? Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch watchmaker and later a Christian writer and public speaker who worked with her father, Casper Ten Boom, her sister, Betsy Ten Boom, and other family members to help many Jewish people escape from Nazis during the Holocaust in World War II by hiding them in her home. They were caught and she was arrested and sent to Ravensbrook concentration camp. This account shows how God answered her prayers and she and Betsy were able not only to smuggle in their woolen underwear, but also her precious Bible. Indeed, the Lord saves his people out of their fears, troubles, and afflictions. Yet, he not only saved them for their benefit, he saved them for ours as well. Corey Timboom, through her writings, continues to this day to make her boast, to make her boast in the Lord. Her words of praise magnify the Lord continually and have encouraged generations of believers. Hallelujah and praise God for that. We're in the middle of a series called Poems, Prayers, and Promises, and this is the next message, and I've entitled it De Delivered and Declaring It. Delivered and Declaring It. Amen? Amen. Yes, that's what we're going to do. So let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, this from a few different uh, we're going to look at the whole psalm, but we're going to look, not look at it in order. We're going to look at it from David's perspective. And I want to touch on the first point is being David's distress. David was in a situation right in the title. It says of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that Abimelech, he drove him out and he went away. So um, as a little rough uh, 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 water ski through David's life at this period of time in um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, David slew Goliath, as you uh, probably remember, and he cut off his head. That's pretty violent. And uh, <laughs> then he defeated the Philistines and they all fled. So uh, next in chapter 18, we see that uh, the women began to celebrate. And they said in verses 6 and 7, as they were, uh, it says, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang one to another as they celebrated. And this was their song. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And what did that do to Saul? Yes, he was jealous. It angered Saul. Saul was anger. And so Saul tried to kill David with a spear twice, two times, and would have done it again. He even tried later on to kill his own son with a spear. That's in chapters 18 and 19. So in chapter 19, we see that David flees from Saul. Okay. And he continues to run. He tries to come back for a minute. And then in chapter 20, he flees again. He gets word from Jonathan that it is dangerous in Saul's house. Get out. So David continues to flee. In chapter 21, David goes to the priests of Nob and leaves with Goliath's sword. And I'm going to come back to what, uh, uh, Goliath's sword in a moment. And then David, uh, after that, flees to Gath. So he leaves the priests of Nob and goes to Gath in chapter 21, verse 10 uh, through 15. And um, <clears throat> so we're going to look at David's decision. Um, David made a couple of decisions here. When he got to Gath, he was in fear. And this is part of his distress, actually. Um, David was afraid of Achish. Now, let me just say, it said in the title, it said of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech. But when we read the story in chapter 21 of 1 Samuel, it says the king was Achish. And let me just clear that up. Achish was his name. Abimelech was his title, much like Pharaoh or Caesar. Um, there were several Abimelechs, several Pharaohs and Caesars. So that's what the discrepancy is. Abimelech is just a title. And he was the king of Gath, which was one of the areas of Philistia or the Philistines. 
Now, um, David was afraid. And in his fear, and, and it's interesting that he was afraid, because remember I said he had Goliath's sword? What did that represent to him? It represented that God delivered him, that God used him over the giant of giants. He had that sword when he went to Gath, and yet he was afraid. In verse uh, 21, 10 through 12, it said, David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another uh, of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. You see, David had gone in. Do you remember Goliath? And if you look at the scripture, it says Goliath of Gath. Yeah, yeah, he was in his hometown. Okay, he took on Goliath on the hill. Now he's in the house where he was. And they said, hey, 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 king, hey, hey King Achish. I don't know if they were allowed to do that to the king. Um, maybe there was a guy that could do that. But they said, don't look now, but that's the guy, man. I said, okay. So what did David do? Well, David made a couple of decisions, and his, one of his decisions was a physical decision. Um, it makes sense, you know, there's a decision that he made in his body, and his emotions, and he decided to pretend to be insane. That's a good one, huh? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that at work when the guy asks me to do some work I don't want to do, <laughs> you know, but the thing is, that's what David did. You know, you're laughing. Um, insanity doesn't always look like that, but it did in David's position. He's, uh, uh, you know, and what he did was, um, look, listen, look at 13. I think I got it on the screen. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Dude. I might just want to just, you know, let Akish have me. I don't think I want this. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's pretty disgusting. Thanks for the uh, amen on the disgustingness over there. It, it, it pretty is disgusting. But, hey, he was desperate. He was really desperate. And that's what he chose to do in the physical. But David made another decision, which was a much better decision. Now, you can question the decision of pretending to be insane. He did, he did what he felt he had to do. But more importantly, he did what he knew he had to do, and he humbled himself, okay? He humbled himself before the Lord. Let's go back to Psalm 34, 4 through 6, and look at this. He said, I sought the Lord. Well, before that, let's look at verse 6. It says, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him. This poor man. And what he was talking about was poor in spirit, like Jesus talked about in the New Testament. He said, this poor man, he knew that he was, he was at the mercy of the, of the Philistines and of King Achish, and he knew his only hope was the Lord himself. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been where you, you just know that your only hope, your only salvation, your only deliverance is the Lord? Actually, as people of God, we should always be there in a way, right? Yeah, but, you know, things get good and we kind of tend to forget. But always remember, the, we humble ourselves. He got, God said he gives grace to those who humble themselves. And that's what he did with David here. He gave David grace. So his, second, his other decision was a spiritual decision, and he chose to seek the Lord. He sought the Lord. He, uh, in verse 4, he, sa he says, I sought the Lord. Verse 5 says, looking to him. While he's doing it in a teaching form, he says, those who look to him are radiant. Well, he's actually saying he looked to him. He sought him, he looked to them, and uh, he cried out to him in verse 6. This poor man cried. Those are all synonyms. Those are all um, just building upon what he did. And he did them all. I sought him, I looked to him, I cried out to him to deliver me. That's what it said. He cried out, and the Lord heard him. So um, that's what David did, and that was his best decision, was to humble himself and to cry out, call out, and look to the Lord. So which brings us to the next point. David was in distress. He was in a dangerous, desperate situation, and David 
is now delivered. David is delivered. Um, if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 14, it says, Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Let me just stop for a minute. There's a lot of favorite scriptures I have. I mean, there's some powerful ones, man. I, I, I just, uh, some of the teachings of Paul are great, and, and, and uh, all of the teachings of Paul are great, but I mean, so, there's certain verses that just grip me. Some of the things Jesus said just really grip me. There are some Psalms, and there's just some wonderful things, but nothing quite attracts me to the scripture like, do I lack madmen? That is just unbelievable. <laughs> do I lack madmen? I mean, what a verse. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Dude, don't I have enough madmen in this country? Did you have me bring me another one? I don't need any more. And he said, do, do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? I am Akish. I don't need this. Shall he come into my house? I don't need this guy. And that is really good uh, because God supernaturally uses Akish's very natural reaction. He doesn't need any more madmen. He's got enough already. I was going to ask you to say amen if we have enough madmen, but we'll let that go. <laughs> don't, 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 don't go there, all right? He supernaturally uses Akish's um, natural reaction. And look what it says in 22.1. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Ad Adullam. And lest you, lest you think that the reason David got saved was because he pretended to be insane, that's not it. God used that. God have, could, could have used anything. He wanted to, you know. There are some commentators that say that was sinful of David to do that. I don't know. I'm not going to go there. That's not my point. But the point is, is... Uh, that is not inspired in and of itself. There's, there's no scripture that commands us to act like madmen, okay? Or mad people, whatever. But it is God who delivers him. And David is delivered from, he is delivered. Uh, uh, look what he says. He says in verse 4 of, of Psalm, I sought the Lord, he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. David was afraid and God delivered him. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you now, God will deliver us from whatever we're afraid of. All right? And we've, we've, we've gone into the lion's den, as it were, and yet, um, or, or let's just keep it in this, this, this area. We face giants, and we've seen God's deliverance, and yet the next giant that comes along, we may feel fear. And he doesn't say, he says fear not in the scripture, but that's not, don't, don't have the emotion of fear. That's quite natural. That's fine. He, it's okay to have an emotion of fear. What we don't want to have is a spirit of fear. The difference is, is the spirit of fear drives us to do what God did not command us to do or to leave out what God did command us to do. It causes us to go away from God into ourself or worse. That is the spirit of fear. But the emotion of fear if properly, will drive us towards the Lord. It will cause us to fall on our knees like David say, and this poor man will cry out to the Lord because, God, I'm scared, but I know you got it. Not only do you have my back, you got my front. God will deliver us from our fears. God, in verse 6, delivered him from his troubles. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. You see, he had fears within and troubles without, and God delivered him from both. And that is the God I serve. Is it the God you serve? Amen. Amen. That's, God, that's the God. He will save you from whatever's within and without. And let me just say the point here that it is the Lord who is the one who delivers. All right? In verse 4, he says, I sought the Lord, and he delivered me. Verse 5 he says this more, the Lord heard him and he saved him. It is the Lord who delivers and who saves. And then in verse 7, there's an interesting verse. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. 
Now, one thing in the Old Testament you want to be aware of, a lot of times when it says the angel of the Lord, uh, it, it's my belief they're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate um, existence, that the angel of the Lord most often in the Old Testament is Christ himself, okay? It's a little ambiguous in this verse, but it very well could be because look what it says. It says the angel of the Lord camps around him and delivers them. All right. So I don't want to get too far off into that. That's not the important point here. The point is, is he can do what he did with Corey Tim Boom and surround us with angels or he can be the angel himself. And in the New Testament, he doesn't do it that way because guess what? We have the Holy Spirit with us. OK, David didn't have that. So um, the angel of the Lord, the point being, it is God himself, God, the father, God, the son, God, the spirit. He himself saves us and delivers us from everything that we go through. Now, David was in distress. He was in a desperate situation. David cried out to the Lord and he was delivered. And now David, what did I call this one? De uh, delivered and declaring it. Yeah. David declares his deliverance. He doesn't keep it in. He lets it out. And that's what we need to do, brothers and sisters. We need to let it out. Okay? Don't bottle it up. What's the point? Let it out. You know, I was just saying to somebody, I was 25 years old when I came to the Lord. Both my sons are heading down south, and uh, they're younger than I was. When I was their age, you would, if I was heading south, it was because uh, something was really wrong, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Praise God, he saved me. He, and, 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 uh, and Bobby's wife said, hey, amen, because <laughs> she knows. But, you know, um, Declaring, somebody declared they were saved from sin and spoke it to me. And the Holy Spirit was active and alive. And he quickened that word and that testimony that somebody gave me and used it to save my soul. Amen. Declare your deliverance, brothers and sisters. Declare your deliverance. Let's look at how David did it. He, did, he had several different points. First of all, he praised the Lord. Now we're going to go back. We did this inverted order. We looked at the middle of the psalm. Now we're going to go back to the beginning and look because that is the setting of what he did. And now here's, here's the response. His response is, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There's so much there, so much meat there. But, I mean, that, that's a whole sermon right there, a whole teaching. Uh, you can almost get a whole series out of that. But I'm, I'm just going to touch on it and just say his soul boasted in the Lord. He praised the Lord, and it said it will continually be in my mouth over and over and over again. He's not going to stop talking, you know. The only way you're going to stop talking is people are going to get, either get saved and, and, and get, or they're just going to walk away and say, I can't take that Christian stuff, man. I can't take it, right? You ever been there? You been there when they walked away from you? Good, that means it's in your mouth. If you haven't, let's start. and let's, let's, let's. The goal is not to drive them away, but the goal is to let the Lord attract them. But the goal is to let the Lord do what he wills. Amen. Our goal is for his praise to be continually in our mouth, magnifying him, and let us exalt his name together. That's one of the things that we do. That's why, one of the reasons why we're here together. You know, That's one of the things that, of the body is exalting his name together in fellowship. Second thing he did is testify about the Lord. Well, that was part of it. Um, but let's look at verse 2 and a couple other verses. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. He's testifying. He's declaring uh, what God has done. In fact, most of this psalm is telling about what God did. Another psalm, I believe, is Psalm 18, I think, is, is it, uh, where he just declares over and over again. Uh, what God's done in many other places. I sought the Lord in verse four and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. He's sitting there telling in song form, in psalm form of what God did to him. And just like I said with Corey Tim Boom, where uh, for the last 50 years or 40 years or whatever it's been since she, she wrote, and I think she died 40 years ago, um, her teachings go, her, her writings go on. Well, how much more of the inspired word of God when David just put down to pen and said, I'm going to write a song and I'm going to tell what good things God has done for me. And, and thousands of years later, we stand here, we sit here, and we again 
hear what God's doing. He testified about the Lord. So not only did he praise the Lord and testify to the Lord, he did something else. He gave a warning to unbelievers. See, when we speak of God, when, when his praise is continually in my mouth, and when I am testifying about him, it will be a warning unto believe, unbelievers. In verse 16, he says, The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory from, of them from the earth. In verse 21, it says, Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. You notice he said, used the word condemned. What do we know from Romans 8.1? There is now no, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? But those who are not in Christ Jesus, David says it right there. There's condemnation. So um, that's a warning to unbelievers. So he praises, he testifies, he warns, and then he talks of the promises, the promises to the believers. Um, verse 15 and, and, and going forward, the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears to, to their, toward their cry. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. Not None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. He's speaking promises to us. And in every one of those verses there, he's, he's reminding us that God will deliver us. God delivered me. He will deliver you. God delivered this poor man. He will deliver this poor woman, this poor man. He will deliver you just like he delivered me. And he goes on and on and on because, again, the word is continually in his mouth. So not only a promise to the uh, believers, um, but he, uh, he, he builds on that by teaching, teaching the believers. And, and um, look at um, verse 11 through 14. Come, O children. Listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And the next three or four verses there are talking about the fear of the Lord. What man is there that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. This is an aspect of fearing the Lord that he's teaching. And he goes on to, to teach some more, but those are the ones I wanted to highlight. And he's teaching about the fear of the Lord and, for example, keeping your tongue from evil, turning away from evil. How is that done? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have that in our own natural selves. Our own natural bent is away from God. It is to turn away quite naturally. Some think they don't. There are many people who think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't, I don't hurt anybody intentionally, you know, um, uh, so, yeah, and most of us that say that, we do. We do try, you know, we get into an argument, we intend to inflict hurt and so forth like that. But that's not the point. The point is, is to follow the Lord and as the temple of God, to li live in His way, in His manner, takes the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and it, it requires the fear of the Lord. It illustrates the fear of the Lord, but it also requires the fear of the Lord. And let me just make, say a word on the fear of the Lord. Um... I don't want to go too far down this road, but I, I do remember, I, I've heard somebody say, and, and I really heard this, this is not a joke, I heard somebody say, Jesus is my dude, okay? Jesus is my dude. Um, I heard somebody say, Jesus is my boy. He and I are boys. I, I understand that, okay? I don't want to come down too hard on that because I, I know where the person's coming. We have fellowship with Jesus. That's, that's fine. But let me say that the fear of the Lord is not, a dude. We're not fearing a dude. I'm telling you that now. We're fearing the holy God of all creation. And he deserves some reverence up in here. Okay? The scripture says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ doesn't say that he's my dude. He's my boy. It says every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? That's powerful. 
So I understand what you're saying when you say that, but, but keep in mind, fear the Lord, respect Him, honor Him, revere Him. A th- a word about, one word about keeping your tongue from evil in verse 13. The ancients used to say this, there are as many sins of the tongue as there are letters in the alphabet. <laughs> you know what? There are so many sins of the tongue. And how do we... Just, just read James, okay? Just read James chapter 3, the beginning of that, to look at what the tongue is. To keep our tongue requires the, the most sincere power of the Holy Spirit to keep our tongue from evil. So um, he... Uh, praises the Lord, he, he, he warns unbelievers, he promises believers, he teaches the fear of the Lord, and then he invites all to experience the Lord. And I think, to, for me, this is the high point of this whole passage, is verse 8. I love this. This is one of my favorite verses. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Are you kidding me? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Wow, I love that. I absolutely love tasting the Lord. That is really weird if you think about it. I can, get, I can wrap my head around seeing, but tasting is kind of... Uh, but tasting is a form of experience. Think about what we do, experiencing. Think about that. First of all, we taste, we taste for two, two, two ways, right? One way we taste is... What are we tasting for? Well, it might be to see if it's poison, but, <laughs> okay, it's primarily to see if it's any good, if we like it, right? Okay? You all that cook, and I don't. I've seen you. You know? You're seeing if the right ingredients are in there. You're testing it out. He says, test the Lord, when he says, taste the Lord. But then there's another form of tasting, you know? And I think of, uh, well, it's Fourth of July. I think of a nice big hamburger, Right? Okay, there's other things. You might like a steak or whatever, but just think of how we taste and savor, man. Oh, mm, yeah. You know what I think, though? You can have your hamburger. If I had my druthers, uh, I would have like a gallon bucket or two-gallon or five-gallon bucket of butterscotch pudding, man. Oh my gosh, that stuff is good. Butterscotch pudding. I would like dip my head in it and just roll. Mm, yeah, baby. Oh, mm, ah. Taste the Lord. Get into him. Not only see if he's good, but know that he's good. Take it in more than you would, well, I would. Uh, uh, pudding, whatever you would take in, okay? In the spiritual realm, take him in, taste him, and experience him. And that's what he's saying. And then seeing is observing him. Experience him, observe what he does. Live the life that God has, which is life most abundant. That's what he's calling us to. And that's why he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You don't believe the Lord is good? Taste and find out. Watch, observe, see. If you, if you have true eyes open and true spiritual mouth, if you will, open, you will realize that God is good. And good is not a good enough word to describe it. Amen. So how do we apply the word here? How do we apply this? Well, <laughs> I like that man. He's listening. Y'all know what to get me on my birthday, right? And some Tums afterwards or some kind of medicine. <laughs> pepto I don't know what I'm going to need after, but, you know. Um, applying the word. I want, you, I want to look at applying the word, and I'm going to put something up in just a moment. I'm going to say it this way. David's method should be the believer's method. When we're in distress, David's method should be our, our method. And let's put up here, if you will, let's look at this little chart here. That's not big enough. Next time I... Teach, give me bigger font, would you? You might want to. Yeah, that's really little, man. Um, I'll tell you what it says. Well, I hope you can see it. Because I don't have the notes. <laughs> Jerry asked me, can, does he want me to help? Nice. I like that. Sure, brother. Um, notice that that's pretty much my outline on the left side there. David's distress, David's decision, David is delivered. And David declares his deliverance. 
Look at what it says in the New Testament. And I'm just going to go through this quickly. And this is what we need to do. Do the same thing David did. Believers will be afflicted. In 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. John 15.20, Jesus says, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. How about 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9? And I just love what Greg read this morning when he talked about in, in Psalm, uh, Isaiah 53, the Lord was smitten and afflicted, yes, for us, right? Remember, he's our master, and if they hated him, they'll hate us. And uh, while we won't get crucified, well, we could, but it will not save anybody. But um, Paul said uh, in 2 Corinthians, he was afflicted in every way. He was perplexed. He was persecuted. He was struck down. And this is the normal Christian life. Peter also says uh, persecution uh, and, and suffering is normal for the Christian life. Secondly, we are to call on the Lord. Just like David made a decision, the spiritual decision he made is the one we should make. Matthew 6, 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is, ask the Lord for deliverance. And these are just the same points that I, that, that I gave you in David's life. Look to the Lord. Hebrews 12, uh, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us and let us run with endurance the race, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Seek the Lord. He says in Matthew 7, ask the Lord. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Call on the Lord. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. First Peter 5 says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And then, uh, and David was delivered. God promises to deliver us. Let us bask in that. Let us live in that and realize that he says he saves us from sin. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, Jesus said in John 8, 36. For the person who has died from sin, Paul says in Romans 6, has been freed from sin. Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from, uh, in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 2 Corinthians 3, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, that is deliverance from sin. Galatians 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He saves us from sin. He delivers us from sin. He delivers us from very death. 1 Corinthians 15, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, they sh then shall come to pass the saying, O death, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, death, where is thy victory? Hallelujah. Yes, God saves us from sin. He delivers us from death as well. Blessed in Revelation 20 and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over the second death. Uh, has, over such, the second death has no power. If that doesn't get you going, I don't know what does. You know, I like what somebody said. If that doesn't get your fire started, your logs are wet. We are like David to declare his deliverance. And I'll go through these pretty quickly. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice in Philippians 4. Remember this. This is applying. This is what we want to do all the time. Uh, Mark 5, 19. Jesus told the demoniac, delivered from thousands of demons, he said, go home and tell what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So we are to testify of the Lord. And he said, we will be witnesses, like he said, the Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you, which he did in Acts chapter 2, he's upon us now. He lives in us, and we will be his witnesses. We are to warn slash admonish. Therefore, in Acts 20, uh, Paul said, for three years, I did not cease to admonish with tears, day in and day out. Jude 22 and 23, have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Also, promise Exhort each other. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to each other, admonishing one another. Also, the same verse, he says, let the spirit of Christ dwell in you, teaching, teaching each other. 
through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And then inviting, same thing David did, invite. Acts 16, 31, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Invite them. Invite them. Uh, what, do, what is the Great Commission? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And lo, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We need to completely follow David's method in this particular psalm in our lives by uh, remembering to rejoice in difficult situations. When you have a difficult situation, as tough as it is, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Call on the Lord in difficult times. Look to him. Cry out to him. Give thanks in all things. It's summed up in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 to 17. See that no one repays evil, anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good one to another. Rejoice always and pray without ceasing, giving thanks to the Lord. Amen? All right. I'm going to take a little sip of this, and I'm going to come on down. We're going to come to the Lord's table now. This is the table of the Lord, the table of deliverance. And God invites everybody to come to his table, those who are believers, those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He invites you to come. You do not have to be a member of Bay Ridge Christian Church but you, uh, to partake, but you do need to be a member of God's church, which means have uh, received the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're free to take. If you haven't already, I didn't mention, but there's some packets in the back. You can make your way back there even now if you don't have one. We're going to take it together in just a moment. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of my blood in the New Testament. As often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this cup, take this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes. Our Father who is in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you are our rock. You are our fortress and our deliverer. From creation week, even until this very hour, you have continued to deliver your people from evil and from the evil one. Though your people have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, we have never, ever had to fear evil. You've promised us that you will be our hiding place, Lord. You, will, uh, you hide us in the shelter of your wings. Thank you, God, for sending us your son who died that we will always be in your love and in your care. We're grateful to you that you make your people radiant and our faces will never be ashamed. Amen. Amen. Take and eat. Lord Jesus, you are our Lord. Today we magnify you and we exalt your name together. We thank you for humbling yourself on the cross that we may be saved from sin and saved from death. Death has no victory because of you. You, Lord, point us to the Father. And you sent us your Holy Spirit. You are the head of the body, the church of God. We thank you for never leaving us, for never forsaking us, and being the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are grateful to you for redeeming the life of your servants, and that those who take refuge in you, there will be no condemnation. Take a drink. Holy Spirit of God, we are grateful that you dwell in us. You came to live in us when you didn't have to, but you did it out of your love, out of the love of Jesus, out of the love of God the Father. And we're grateful that because, you, because of you, we can indeed taste 
and see that the Lord is good. Lead us as you will, that the praises of Jesus will continually be in our mouths. To God be the glory, lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now receive the benediction from our Lord. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. May the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. May whatever you do in word or deed be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Be blessed. Go forth and be a blessing. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.